Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Overnight, alarms sounding as a dangerous tornado outbreak swept through the plains and Midwest. Not looking good. Reports of more than 20 tornadoes. It's coming our way. Tearing roofs off buildings, snapping trees, and leaving homes in tatters. That's a big old tornado. Funnel clouds spotted from Kansas and Nebraska. Look at that funnel right up there. To Illinois and Missouri, where authorities say a tornado in Smithville injured two people when it toppled their camper. Tornadoes across the region turning buildings into rubble, with wind gusts in some areas reaching up to 70 miles an hour. The roof just got picked up and it flipped over on itself. In Iowa, a tornado took the roof off this church. I don't know if we'll end up fixing the, the building or if it'll be a total loss. And in the Quad Cities, even forecasters at the National Weather Service forced to hunker down, posting on social media, during the tornado warning, we took cover in our storm shelter at the office. A Sioux County Sheriff posting this picture of this mangled playset as a deputy sheriff caught dramatic lightning strikes on his cruiser's dash cam video. The severe weather also impacting air travel across the Midwest, with over 600 flights delayed out of Chicago's Midway Airport alone. All part of a severe weather system now moving east, with more rain, hail, and tornadoes possible. God controls the skies and the rain. God controls the wind. God has power over the clouds. God has power over lightning. God is in control of all things including the weather. Through his providence, God provides for and protects his children. But he also permits Satan, demons, and mankind to exercise their limited will to commit acts of sin, evil, and wickedness. We may not always know why evil acts or natural disasters happen, but we can be assured that God is working all things together for his purpose and for our good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now we're going to turn to the severe weather outbreak in the Med Midwest with nearly two dozen tornadoes touching down. Rob Marciano was in Smithville, Missouri, which was hit by a twister. This is just one example of what some folks here in the Midwest are going through. This home flipped on its side, their belongings in tatters across the ground. Here's their bed. This is where typically the couple would be sleeping. This hit mid-morning, thankfully, but and this family has one harrowing story of survival because of it. Oh my God! This morning, the Midwest reeling after more than two dozen reported tornadoes ripped through the region. Oh my gosh! Tornado on the ground to our east! This massive twister tearing through Houghton, Iowa, one of at least 10 tornadoes reported in the state. It's getting bigger! Those powerful winds sending debris flying. Look at that funnel right up there. In nearby Nebraska, this tornado drilling its way across the ground. And in Missouri, an EF-1 tornado in Smithville with winds up to 95 miles per hour, tearing the roof off this lodge and flipping over this camper, forcing one family to flee for their lives. With the warnings going off, Crystal and her young son were inside their now destroyed home. They had ran up that hill to the only place they could take cover, inside this brick bathroom. I don't know, survivor mode kicked in, I guess, but I mean, it felt like the longest run of my life. Crystal's husband, Kevin, still recovering from a trucking accident. That shredded camper was their home. The biggest part is just my wife and son. I don't, I really don't know what to tell them right now. All I know is just tell them we just got to stick together. 
you know, my heart just breaks for this family. It is 10 a.m. on the East Coast and 6 p.m. in Dubai, where the city has recorded the biggest rainstorm ever, shutting down one of the world's busiest airports overnight. The Arabian Emirate got more than five and a half inches of rain in just 24 hours yesterday. Usually gets less than that in an entire year. At Dubai's International Airport, it looked like planes were boats treading water on the runway. Flights had to be suspended. And this is one of the world's busiest airports, nearly 200 thousand passengers take off and land each day out on the roads. People got stuck and some had to push their cars through waters up to their waist, all because of the heaviest rainfall in at least 75 years for the normally parched countries of the Persian Gulf. Dubai, which is the UAE's most populous city, got more than five inches of rain in 24 hours. That's more than its average for a whole year. A couple hours south, the region got hit with double that amount, 10 inches of rain and a neighboring Oman police airlifted these lucky people to safety, but at least 18 people died, including a dozen school children when floods swept their bus away and more storms are expected today. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, Look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. From bad to worse, entire regions of Kazakhstan in the north and the west are underwater. Some houses are barely identifiable with water up to their roofs. Evacuations have been underway for two weeks now. Rescuers help us by transporting people, delivering us food, water and gasoline. All generators in the village are working now. President Kasim Jamar Takayev visited some of the worst hit areas. He's called on the government to limit any non-essential spending and use the money to help the people. We are going through difficult times. This is a nationwide disaster, but positive changes are coming now. The water is receding gradually. I think the upcoming 10 days will be the most critical. Several hundred thousand people have said their houses were submerged or even washed away by the floods of the Ural River. It's Europe's third longest, causing extensive damage across parts of Kazakhstan and southern Russia in the past few weeks due to melting ice. Other rivers in Russia, like the Tabol in Siberia, have also burst their banks. Thousands have had to leave the area. Authorities in Russia are being criticized for not paying enough attention to forecasting water levels and responding more effectively. Extreme rainfall, flash floods and thunderstorms have left more than 60 people dead over the past four days in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Heavy flooding due to seasonal monsoon rains killed at least 33 and injured 27 others by Sunday in Afghanistan, while thunderstorms and heavy rain killed at least 36 people in Pakistan. A Taliban spokesperson for the State Ministry for Natural Disaster Management confirmed that almost 20 out of Afghanistan's 34 provinces were affected by extreme monsoon rains, with 6, 600 houses heavily damaged and 200 livestock killed. In neighboring Pakistan, the country's southwest declared a state of emergency on Monday. Authorities in the country said most of the 36 deaths were farmers who were killed by lightning strikes and collapsed houses. Activists are urging governments in Africa to declare a climate emergency and take climate action now. Climate change and droughts also have significant impacts on conflicts in Africa. Severe droughts in Africa are an existential threat to its herders and farmers who depend on rain-fed agriculture. According to the State of the Climate in Africa 2023 report, the continent is warming faster than the global average. Here's a report highlighting the vagaries of climatic changes on the continent. The wrath of climate and its vagaries are showing in Africa. 
The change in the seasonal cycle and unpredictable weather patterns are causing mayhem across the continent. Every region is facing a different calamity. Let's start with East Africa. Rainfall in Kenya has been on a constant since last year. The floods are now a menace. Heavy rains and flooding in Kenya caused heavy destruction in several parts on Thursday. Local media reports put the death toll from flooding in recent days at 11, with over 2,000 people displaced. Kenya's meteorological department has warned the country is set to experience very high rainfall and asked people to prepare for floods. We have people who have been internally displaced who don't have a place to call home, no roof on top of their heads. Their farmlands have been submerged and we are also talking about high rates of wildlife animal conflict. Here we are talking about hippominas that are marauding within the community, scavenging for pasture because their grazing lands have been submerged. And this is really a threat to the community and causing a lot of insecurity. And while it pours in the east, it is scorching further south. This is Malawi. The crop theft has become a problem as the food sources are drying up. Maize farmers are concerned. Their farms are failing because of the drought. They are on the verge of hunger. We have been hit so badly with dry spells here and looking at our situation, the problems are huge and this is just the beginning of bigger problems ahead. Imagine we don't have food this month. And how do we survive until next year, the same month? It will be tough. In response, Malawi President Nazareth Chakwera asked international aid agency donors to help the country avoid hunger. The drought is devastating and stressful for many Malawians. Most cannot pay back creditors, money borrowed for their farms. In the last month, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Zambia have all declared a state of disaster from the drought. This is by far the worst drought in years. Ever since I was born, I have never seen such a drought. This year it's too much. We are going to starve. We were expecting that we would harvest and sell to the national granary, but that will not happen. The heat was just too much. We last had rains in January. By the time the rains came back briefly, part of my crops had already wilted. Zimbabwe's president declared the drought a national disaster and even appealed for over $2 billion to save 2.7 million people from hunger. The weather across the world has turned nasty in the past year, as climate change has doubled down on the impacts of El Nino, making its effects more extreme. A study last October even suggested that human-induced climate change may now be as significant in triggering El Nino conditions as natural causes like sun rays. Aid agency Oxfam warned in late February 2024 that over 24 million people in southern Africa face hunger, malnutrition and water scarcity because of the drought. We have reached the stage where there is literally no pause between major weather disasters hitting the world. It is just one disaster after another. When times were normal, there would be a major disaster every once in a while. But now we have reached the stage where there's literally no pause between them. Sadly, this is how it's going to be now. It's just going to be one disaster after another. And most people will have absolutely no idea why any of this is happening. We are living in very troubled times and people need hope. We read about that hope in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We also read about those who do not believe in Jesus, are condemned and love darkness rather than light in John 3.18-20. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. If you have not already done so, I strongly urge you to call upon the name of Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior today. 
In Israel's north, continuous Hezbollah rocket fire has targeted northern communities with sirens sounding throughout the day with a direct hit to a community center building in the western Galilee, injuring at least 14 men, some in critical condition. In Gaza, one soldier was severely wounded in the northern Gaza Strip. All of these military updates are in the following report. In the latest rocket barrage fired by Hezbollah into northern Israel today, one rocket made a direct hit in the western Galil, hitting a community center building and injuring at least 14 men, with three initially reported in critical condition. In a separate incident, Mata added that a man was critically injured when his car was hit by a Hezbollah drone. This story is developing as sirens are going off continuously. Additionally, in yesterday's reported IDF strike in southern Lebanon, the target was identified as Ismail Yousaf Baz, the commander of Hezbollah's coastal sector. Another top Hezbollah commander was eliminated, this time in the area of Kfaldunin. When an IDF aircraft struck and eliminated the terrorist Muhammad Hussein Mustafa Seshori, Muhammad was the commander of the rocket and missiles unit of Hezbollah's Radwan forces in Lebanon's central and western region. These targeted strikes come just after the terror group launched drones into Israeli territory, injuring three people when they exploded near Bet Hillel yesterday. So far, the skirmishes on the northern border have resulted in at least eight civilian deaths on the Israeli side, as well as the death of 10 IDF soldiers and reservists while Hezbollah has named 278 members who have been killed by Israel in these clashes. In Gaza, a combat soldier from the Shaldag Special Forces Unit was severely wounded in the northern Gaza Strip in a pinpoint operation conducted in Beit Hanun. The soldier was evacuated to the nearest hospital for further treatment. The 162nd Division is continuing to operate in the central Gaza Strip. At the request of the division, the IDF Air Force eliminated a number of terrorists and destroyed terrorist infrastructure. One of the strikes was on a terrorist cell operating an armed drone toward IDF troops in the area. An IDF aircraft struck the terrorists. IAF aircraft also struck a number of rocket launchers that were ready to be launched toward Israeli territory. Palestinian health officials said an Israeli strike killed four people and wounded several others in Rafah, where over half of Gaza's 2.3 million people are sheltering and bracing for a planned Israeli ground offensive into the city, which borders Egypt. Nuclear facilities, weapons factories, missile and drone launch sites, these are just some of the targets in Iran that Israel might hit in the coming days. The Biden administration continues to warn Israel against escalating the conflict. To ease the tension, they're now proposing greater economic sanctions on Tehran. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu explained to young military recruits why Israel must respond to Iran's attack. Iran stands behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah, behind others. But we're determined to win there and defend ourselves in all arenas. Analysts speculate Israel could hit Iranian nuclear facilities or factories and launch sites that made the drone and missile attack possible. Firing 110 ballistic missiles directly to Israel will not get scot-free. We will respond in our time, in our place, in the way that we will choose. On Tuesday, the IDF displayed one of the more than 100 ballistic missiles fired at Israel. These uh, ballistic missiles are ones that has 500 kilos of explosives in the warhead. We're talking about over 110 ballistic missiles coming from Iran aiming towards Israel. These are 60 tons of explosives directly to Israel. On the diplomatic front, the U.S. continues to pressure Israel against a retaliatory strike and has announced it's ready to apply economic sanctions against Iran's missile and drone program. Critics point out that the Biden administration has waived such sanctions in the past. We lifted or waived the sanctions that we had, this administration, on the drones and, and the missiles and on the energy. This is giving them $100 billion in cash to fund their terror operations. And that's why we're seeing this. Senior policy advisor for the U.S. Israel Education Association, Ari Sakra, says most citizens want to send Iran a message. Israelis, I believe, think that we need to return fire. Iran 
cannot be let off with a tongue lashing for, for what they did. There must be a price for impinging upon the security of a sovereign nation. Soccer believes, like many here in Israel, that divine intervention was at work during the attack. I have an axiomatic belief in the existence of a God, a God who pays attention and who cares, especially about what goes on in Israel. And everything I see reinforces that belief. So when I see 99% um, of, um, of rockets that are fired at Israel, of uh, threats, missiles, cruise missiles that are fired at Israel being shot down, um, I wake up the next morning and I thank God for it. Analysts speculate Israel could hit Iranian nuclear facilities Facilities. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 37. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. At least a dozen people have died and more are injured following a Russian missile attack on a city in northern Ukraine earlier today. That's according to Ukrainian officials. Following the attack, President Volodymyr Zelensky again called on Western allies for more air defenses. It was a morning where people were diving for cover uh, amidst the haunting sound of three Russian missiles uh, hitting in the center of the northern city of Chernihiv. Now, it is around 60 miles from the border with Russia. As a result, you don't get much notice when it comes to missile strikes. Sirens will sometimes sound, but you'll often uh, hear the sound of explosions uh, shortly after that. Now, uh, authorities are saying an eight-storey residential block was hit. Rescue teams are still trying to get to people under the rubble. It's a well-rehearsed routine for countless Ukrainian uh, cities that don't necessarily need to be close to the front line. And we can expect the death toll of 14 to rise. But it's interesting that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky isn't just blaming Russia, obviously, for its continued invasion, but he's also taken aim at his Western allies for not giving him sufficient air defences to prevent this attack from happening. Today marks one year since the conflict between the Sudanese armed forces and the Rapid Support Power Military Group began. The situation there has precipitated what the UN calls one of the worst humanitarian disasters in recent memory, displacing more than 8 million people, taking the lives of more than 14,000. In tonight's Prime Focus, we take a look at Sudan one year later, now on the brink of collapse. In Sudan, the concussion from explosions pierced the air and black smoke blankets the horizon. The capital city, Khartoum, and its more than six million people now in the throes of a violent struggle that has taken thousands of lives and disrupted the livelihoods of millions. On April 15th last year, simmering tensions exploded into a full-blown conflict as two generals who've controlled the country since seizing power in 2021 prepared to hand over authority to civilian rule. It marked the beginning of 12 months of horror, intense street battles and airstrikes, reports of unspeakable crimes against women and internet blackouts. The UN says it is the largest displacement of people in the world today. Calls for a ceasefire have gone unanswered. So far, there has been no pause in the violence. How brutal has the fighting been in Sudan? In terms of the stories, 
uh, from people being dismembered, uh, tortures uh, of the most horrible scenes. El Bashir Idris is an analyst and one of the emerging voices on the situation in Sudan. It's a war that, under international law, has broken every single uh, rule and, and code of conduct. The war has made an already fragile humanitarian situation even worse. 8.2 million people forced from their homes, the majority internally displaced inside Sudan, while nearly 2 million have gone to neighboring countries like Chad and South Sudan. 18 million people in the country are facing acute hunger, according to aid groups. We are extremely concerned that we will see catastrophic levels of hunger. Lenny Kinsley works with the World Food Program in Sudan. They provided meals to 250,000 families at the end of March, but she says it simply won't be enough in a few months' time. Can you give us a sense of how the situation is with hunger today versus a year ago? Yeah, so hunger has nearly doubled in the last year. Right now we're looking at 18 million people, 37% of the population, who are in acute levels of hunger. Aid groups say more and more families are becoming food insecure. Kinsley and others are urging the warring sides to establish safe routes for aid to get into the conflict zones. The IPC, which is a rating for hunger across the globe, shows Sudan is approaching level five, the highest level or a catastrophe phase. Calls for international aid are growing louder. The United States has committed nearly a billion dollars in aid, but officials say that is not enough, and only a fraction of that money has actually reached Sudan. <laughs> Through it all, brutal fighting has continued. The situation in Sudan risks creating the world's largest hunger crisis without action, without the immediate scaling up of assistance. And there is no hyperbole that wouldn't hit the mark on this. There is no hyperbole. This is how bad it is. I think more than anything, there, what I've heard is they're holding on to whatever last hope that they have left that this war can end because that's really the only hope they have left to eat, to survive, to make it through another day. People around the world are asking what is going on. Everything seems to be falling apart in every possible way. Violence is at epidemic levels with all the nations around the world full of anxiety and uncertainty of what tomorrow will bring. The Middle East is consumed by civil wars. Planet Earth is on the verge of World War III. Earthquakes are more frequent and more intense. Extreme weather has become the norm. People are starving to death because of politics, war, drought, and other weather-related catastrophes. People are looking for answers, and those who have eyes to see and ears to hear know exactly what is happening. Jesus, who is God in flesh form, is letting us know that through the events taking place around the world, he is returning. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus!
Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.